Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Turner. I'm an archaeologist at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar uh, with Spencer Burke. This is a Four Corners lecture series uh, talk about Mesa Verde's dark skies. So I will introduce Spencer in a few minutes, but first, all of the little formalities. Oops. Uh, I know we still have people joining us who maybe aren't real familiar with Zoom. So I wanted to give you a few instructions. First of all, you're probably seeing our heads floating somewhere in your screen right now. And if we get in the way of the slide, you can always just click on that box that we're in and move us out of the way. Um, we do have a live transcription going. It's not us, it's just automatic. Um, you're probably seeing it either at the top or the bottom of your screen. You can turn that off if it's annoying or turn it on if it's helpful. It's usually pretty good until you get into really technical terminology or foreign languages or anything like that. Um, but I know some people find it really helpful. If you do have questions, uh, use the Q&A function. There's both a, few, a Q and A and probably a chat, but it's easier for us to just monitor one. Um, and we'll probably leave questions till the end and I will be asking the questions uh, to Spencer when we get to the end. Um, we'll try to get all to, to all your questions, but sometimes we have a lot of questions. Uh, if you're having any trouble with the Zoom uh, stream, you can always head over to our live stream on Facebook uh, at crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. And if you would like to watch this again later, it will be on our YouTube station and all of our uh, previous webinar, most of our previous webinars are also up there. Um, and it really helps us out if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and you know, like our videos, it sort of gets us more access as we get more people subscribed. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Crow Canyon, um, our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. That is our beautiful campus here in Cortez, Colorado, in front of the Sleeping Ute Mountain. Crow Canyon wants to acknowledge the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickoria Apache people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections and sacred lands. We wanted to mention that we have had a uh, Crow Canyon trustee has made a challenge match for 2021 um, for up to $50,000. Every dollar you support or you contribute in support of our webinar series will be matched up to $50,000. Looks like we're up to about 26,000 this week. Um, so please consider uh, donating to that and helping us reach that challenge. We have webinars pretty much every week uh, for the rest of the year. Um, and we have two coming up here. So next week we have uh, Western Pawnee Land, Oral Traditions, Archaeology, and Euro-American Accounts of Pawnees in the Front Range with Carlton Gover. Uh, that is next Thursday, but it's at a different time than usual. It's at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So you might want to make a note of that. The week after that, we have um, a Four Corners Lecture Series again about uh, cultural inventories in Southeast Utah with Ryan Spittler. Um, and that'll be back at the regular time. We like to share this slide. A lot of people have asked us how they can help with uh, indigenous communities and the devastating effects that COVID has had on those communities here in the Southwest. Uh, these are some of the um, funds that we're aware of and um, can share that with you. Um, if you want to get back to the slide, you can always go back to our YouTube page after it's posted uh, tomorrow. All right, so tonight we have a little bit of a different webinar. We're going to be hearing about Mesa Verde's Dark Skies, Star Stories. Uh, our speaker tonight is Spencer Burke, who is a park ranger and a visual information specialist at Mesa Verde National Park. 
Uh, as a ranger with the National Park Service, Spencer has led field trips on hikes into the Grand Canyon, developed education programs on the Channel Islands, and collaborated with Pueblo community members to expand Pueblo perspectives in interpretation at Mesa Verde. Uh, Spencer received his BA in history at Harvard University and was the John G. Owens Fellow of Mesoamerican Archaeology at the Peabody Museum, where he researched the museum's collections. And he's going to be speaking to us today about Mesa Verde's recent designation as a dark sky park. So I will turn it over to you now and stop sharing. All right, welcome Spencer, hey. thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you for having me, Crow Canyon. Um, it's, uh, it's a real treat to be here. So I'm joining from um, the middle of Mesa Verde National Park here. Uh, my name is Spencer Burke, and my title with the park now is Visual Information Specialist. So I'm in charge of uh, things like the park website and creating new waysides for the park, and I'm pretty new in this position. Um, and I'm excited to also be what I have decided to call a dark ranger, um, to be involved in all of this great um, work uh, we're doing now on protecting dark skies in the region. So can everyone see my slide? Yes, great. I can see it, yes. Um, I have a great photo here of Point Lookout, which is the uh, iconic view you see when you first come into the park. Uh, great photo by Jacob Frank, who provided a lot of the photos that I'll be using in this presentation. Actually, Spencer, can I interrupt you? We're not yeah. actually seeing your slide, I'm sorry. What's that? We're not actually seeing your slides yet. Oh, okay. Let's try this again. All right, it's coming through now. There it goes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so, I think that we can all remember our first time seeing a night full of stars. Uh, I'd just like you to take a moment to remember the first time you saw a thousand stars in the sky, the first time you saw the Milky Way. Do you remember where you were, who you were with, how you felt? Think about it for a moment. If you're with someone, you can tell them. I grew up in Southern California and I remember the moon and how amazed I was when I learned about the pattern behind its changing shape. Uh, but the stars did not make an impression on me as a kid. And that's just because there weren't that many of them. Um, you're looking at a photo from space of Southern California there. You see that bright light of the Los Angeles metropolitan area. I grew up just outside of that really bright spot, but there weren't many stars. Um, but the summer when I was 10, my dad invited me along on a business trip to Phoenix and Phoenix was hot and busy and bright. And we left early and drove back through the Sonoran Desert at night. And I remember that I had, had dozed off and woke up when the car wheels went from pavement to dirt. And I remember looking over at my dad and being a little confused. And he said, I want to show you something. And he drove on farther out on this dirt road, eventually turned the car off and we got out. And the first sensation getting out in the middle of the desert was darkness. You couldn't really see anything. The moon was down, but then, my eyes adjusted. I remember leaning back against the hood of the car, hearing the engine kicking underneath and watching the night grow brighter. As my eyes adjusted, I kept saying, wow, wow, wow. Because the longer we looked, the more stars emerged from the dark. Um, the sky above glittered with stars, thousands of them. The Milky Way swam across the sky. It was so bright, the Milky Way cast shadows over the creosote and Choya. And at the time, I thought that that was a rare, special phenomenon, like 
seeing that with something like an eclipse or a passing comet. And it wasn't until later in life that I realized that that was the, the default view of the night sky for the vast majority of human history. For all of human history, our ancestors all around the world enjoyed a night full of stars and planets and galaxies and meteors. And until about a century ago, every night, everywhere in the world, it was dark. Uh, people watched the passage of the stars, the setting of the sun, the moon, the planets. They saw patterns and characters in the stars. They sat around fires, wrapped up in turkey feather blankets, looking up, and they told stories about them. Their observations helped them keep track of time and the passage of the seasons. Their stories helped them pass down knowledge about weather patterns, animal migrations, the rhythm of the seasons through the generations. So the stars that we see today, when we see them, haven't changed much from the ones that our ancestors all spent a lot of time gazing at. Here in the Four Corners region was the same. The high elevation here, the dry climate made for particularly clear views of the night sky. And for many thousands of years, people have looked up at the same sky above us. The Diné, Ute, Apache, Pueblo people all pass down their own stories. And in places around the Four Corners like Chaco and Chimney Rock and Mesa Verde, ancestral Pueblo architecture reflected and tracked the movements of celestial bodies. At Mesa Verde, uh, architectural alignments with celestial phenomena have been observed in places like Balcony House and Sun Temple and Cliff Palace. So it's only in the last, let's say, 0.0005% or so of human history when artificial lights have taken over the dark. Uh, this started in the 1870s. Um, the sky has dimmed for each passing generation since then. So we have a picture here of early streetlights Broad on Broadway in New York City in 1881. A few decades later in 1913, you can see a lot more lights have been added. And it brings us up to today in 2021 when you can't even see any stars in the sky in a city like New York. You can see the same change in satellite photos. Look at the growth uh, in light over 70 years, from the 1950s to the 2020s. And that one is, is projected into the future a little bit, but I think that things are actually even brighter than they were projecting back in 2001. You can see how the, the brightness has grown. Really, the whole eastern half of the country has, uh, has sky glow now. And there's places left in the western half of the country that still appear black on that map, but there's increasingly few of them. From space, it's easy to see exactly where people live and don't on Earth. Do you recognize what that is there? You can see, looking down on Egypt, the, the population centers along the Nile River and where people don't live out in the desert. So in the United States today, only about 1% of Americans live in a place where they can see a natural night sky untouched by artificial light. Uh, it's estimated that only 20% of children born all around the world in 2021 will ever see the Milky Way, even once. 80% of the world's population now lives under sky glow. And you can see sky glow here in this picture on the left, the before picture. It's just all lights lighting up the sky, covering up the darkness, covering up the view of the stars. And this is a great before and after. It shows uh, the 2003 Northeast blackout when millions of people lost power. You can see as soon as power goes out, the sky returns. And this is one place, this is one kind of pollution, light pollution, that is entirely reversible, unlike many other ones. And that's an exciting thing about combating light pollution, is it is entirely reversible. So this is Los Angeles, one of the largest cities in the United States and the world. And in a 
city that's bright like a lot of Los Angeles, uh, you can only see the first magnitude stars. Those are the very brightest stars. So that's usually 11 or 12 stars that you can see in the sky. Compare that view to a place like Capitol Reef National Park in Utah. In a dark place like Capitol Reef, you can see the first magnitude stars and also the second and third magnitude stars. And that's when you get to a, this feeling of infinitude, uh, this feeling of there being hundreds of stars, being able to see the three dimensionality of the sky. It's that feeling that bowled me over in the Sonoran Desert when I was 10. If the night's dark enough, you let your eyes adjust long enough, that third dimension of the sky becomes really apparent. And theoretically, on a great night, you can see 3,000 3, stars uh, with just the naked human eye at one time. So in the difference between those two views, what, what have we lost? What have we gained? I think some people would say, why does it matter? Uh, they might say, this is the cost of progress, or maybe that all this light has made us safer, it's made us healthier, it's made us more productive, it's the price we pay for civilization. Um, well, I'd say that we're, you're wrong if you say that. <laughs> uh, why does it matter? So first of all, the definition of light pollution is the inappropriate and excessive use of artificial light. Uh, light that is appropriate is not light pollution. It is important to have lights on outside at night. They, they do protect us at times. But the amount that we light the night now is usually inappropriate and excessive. And the more you learn about it, the more you see all these places where we really don't need lights outside at night. So one thing that surprised me when I first started to delve into this topic is brighter lights don't necessarily mean safer. Um, no scientific study has ever found a correlation between lighting and safety. Uh, 2015 study that was done in the United Kingdom found that there was absolutely no change in traffic road collisions and incidents of crime across 62 different municipalities they studied where some kept their lights on bright like they were, some dimmed them, and some turned them off completely. It didn't matter. It was the same in all those situations. So this was kind of hard for me to believe at first. Evidence suggests that these... Um, the benefits of lights are actually balanced out by the dangers posed by poor lighting. So here's an example. The glare of lights will blind us at night. So does that light there really help us see better? Uh, in fact, studies show that property crime and graffiti actually goes up with brighter lighting. Criminals like to see what they're doing too. And the key to optimizing your vision at night is actually contrast, the difference in brightness between what you're trying to see and the background. Bright street lights ahead of you or headlights shining in your eye or glaring off a building, that all makes it a lot harder to see. I'm sure we've all experienced that while driving at night. You have to put your hand over your eyes to block that light. So here you can see kind of a typical outside light doesn't actually show us the person standing at the gate there. So nighttime safety is really about having the right amount of light focused in the right place, the right color of light, um, rather than just having a lot of it. So far from being contradictory, lighting our nights for safety and controlling light pollution actually go together hand in hand. And that's one of the most compelling arguments for controlling our lighting at night. Secondly, uh, artificial light at night is actually pretty bad for us. Um, being awake at night is bad for people. Research has linked extended exposure to artificial light at night with depression, sleep disorders, obesity, diabetes, cancers. So light at night interferes with our natural circadian rhythm, which in turn suppresses our body's production of melatonin. Our body only will produce melatonin during darkness. 
light from the moon or from stars or from candles or fire doesn't disrupt melatonin, but electric light does. Melatonin plays a key role in keeping cancers from growing. Uh, it's also been linked to protecting the body from COVID-19. Next, artificial light disrupts ecosystem. Uh, lights in cities will lead sea turtle hatchlings away from the ocean and into towns. Uh, they will disrupt amphibians uh, mating patterns, the migrations of birds and moths. Uh, they interfere with the lives of all sorts of nocturnal animals. And then light pollution is a waste of energy and money and it contributes to to climate change. Um, lights should illuminate really only what and when they are needed. At least a third of all outside lighting is wasteful and polluting, uh, which is the equivalent of about $3 billion spent a year, uh, or the equivalent of about 3 million cars emissions in a year. To me, the most important one of all these is that the night sky inspires us. And when we don't have the sky, we, we really lose something, a big part of what makes us human. Um, the stars make us human. They connect us to our ancestors. Um, when we hear what Vincent van Gogh wrote in 1888, he said, it often seems to me that the night is much more alive and richly colored than the day. I don't think many people alive today would say that. The, the night is more alive and richly colored than the day. Even on a clear, dark night, the human eye struggles to notice these different colors in the night uh, because we work with two kinds of light receptors. We have rods and cones in our eyes. Uh, they don't, the, the cones are the color sensors and they don't really respond to faint illumination. The rods are more finely attuned to dim light, but they don't, aren't as good as discriminating colors. So when you look at a starry sky, the sensitive colorblind rods do most of the work and the stars appear mostly white. But if you stay out there long enough and you let your eyes adjust fully, uh, which takes a couple of hours, then you get that true three-dimensionality of the sky. You actually start to see all the different colors in the stars. And I think that's part of what Van Gogh was talking about. Reds and oranges and blues and yellows. Um, most people who live in cities, that's about 40% of Americans today, live amid so much electric light that their eyes will never transition uh, to scotopic or night vision. They never switch from the cone cells to the rod cells. So back to Los Angeles again. What have we lost? What have we gained? Um, the psychologist Peter Kahn has this idea he calls environmental generational amnesia. And that's a problem where people don't recognize there's a problem because this has changed so gradually over the last few generations, over the last hundred years, if you were to take uh, your great great grandparent and take them to Los Angeles, they might be really upset about the change that they see, uh, the, the erasure of the night sky. But it's happened gradually enough that we have an amnesia about it. We haven't really noticed this change. So the IDA is the International Dark Sky Association, and they are headquartered in Tucson, Arizona. They were founded in 1988 um, with, the, with the project of battling that generational amnesia about raising awareness about the dark sky and what we lose by covering it in artificial light. In 2001, the IDA started the International Dark Places Program uh, which encourages communities, parks, and protected areas all around the world to preserve and protect dark sites through responsible lighting and public education. The very first dark sky park declared in 2007 was just across the border from us in Utah, uh, Natural Bridges National Monument, just below the Bears Ears. And Natural Bridges remains 
one of the darkest spots in the lower 48 states. Certainly one of the darkest places I've ever been to. Mesa Verde's work to, became, to become a dark sky park began in 2014. And over the years since then, various rangers, volunteers, and park partners from the Mesa Verde Museum Association uh, have dedicated themselves to drawing awareness to Mesa Verde's dark skies and assembling all the pieces that are necessary uh, for our application to become a dark sky park. So what does it take to become a dark sky park? Well, first off, you need to have fairly dark skies, uh, but it turns out you need a lot of other things as well. And when I volunteered um, two years ago to take this application and get it across the finish line, I thought that it would, it really just required having dark skies and proving it. Uh, and was a little bit overwhelmed by how much else was involved in the application. Uh, this actually was a case where the, the global pandemic that we all experienced last year uh, had a good silver lining in the fact that it took a little pressure off of our tour operations as we weren't doing tours of the cliff dwellings last year. And it allowed us to tackle some projects that had been placed on the back burner for a long time, like this dark sky, like this dark sky application. So a few of the pieces that we needed to assemble were sky quality readings, um, documentation of our dark skies, photos of the light domes of surrounding communities, a exterior lighting assessment um, of every single exterior light in the park and whether it was dark sky friendly or not, uh, a lighting management plan for how to make all of our exterior lighting dark sky friendly in the future, a long-term monitoring plan for uh, how to consistently measure our dark skies to see if things are getting better or worse over time, um, evaluation of current and suspected threats to our dark skies, uh, to demonstrate our leadership and engaging with partners in restoring dark skies in the park and in our surrounding community, um, interpreting our dark skies and light pollution for visitors to the park, and to demonstrate community support by asking uh, neighboring towns and organizations like Crow Canyon, thank you, uh, to provide letters of support um, uh, for, this, for this project, uh, to, to present a community engagement on this issue outside of just the park. So these are what we call light domes. Um, these are photos taken by the National Park Service Dark Skies Program. Uh, these specific ones were taken at the Farview Lodge. And the, the bright stuff at the horizon are the light domes of neighboring cities. So what you see looking south from Farview there are uh, the, sky, the sky dome, the light domes of Shiprock and Farmington to the south. So then you can see farther up in the sky, it's pretty dark. Uh, in that top photo, you can see the Milky Way, that line extending north south. That's actually giving off um, quite a bit of, of light in the sky. Here's a photo uh, taken to demonstrate our light, our dark skies uh, for the IDA. This is the view looking southwest from Moorfield Campground, showing the Milky Way. Here's a photo looking south southwest from the Farview Lodge area again, and that shows the light dome from Shiprock, as well as that great view of the Milky Way. So next is take, was taking um, measurements of our dark skies. We did do this using an instrument called a sky quality meter or an SQM. And there it is being demonstrated down in Saguaro National Park. So this was one of the most fun parts of becoming a dark sky park. So a team of us got to drive all around the park at night, including places where we don't usually get to go at night and taking measurements all around the park. So, you hold this little box up straight up to the zenith and push a button, wait a few seconds and it'll beep and it will give you a number. And this is our table of numbers that we, uh, we, we gathered the data for at all these different spots around the park. 
these numbers are in uh, units of magnitude over square arc seconds. And I do not know enough about dark sky physics to have any idea what that unit means. Uh, but the number we were looking for, the magic number was 21.2. And if anything higher than that meant that we had dark enough skies to become a dark sky mark. And as you can see, all of our numbers are over 21.2. Our average was about 21.334. So this was very exciting because we could pat ourselves on the back and say, congratulations. It turns out that we do in fact have dark skies. So the next piece was uh, examining all of the out out outside lights in the park. And for this, uh, we turned to Dr. Brian Bollinger, who's an associate professor of civil engineering, very involved in dark sky issues. Uh, he's at Ohio Northern University. He came to Mesa Verde and looked at every single outside light in the park. And I was rather surprised to find how many outside lights we had in the park. It's a total of 964. And Dr. Bollinger's survey found that only about half of those were compliant um, with dark sky standards. To qualify as a dark sky park, we had to have at least two thirds of our lighting be dark sky friendly. So to be dark sky friendly, outdoor lighting should be on only when it's needed. So lights that have a timer or a motion sensor are preferable. Uh, they need to light only the area that needs it. Uh, so that frequently means having a hood or a shield over the light. So it's not pointing out and up, uh, but just down where you probably need the lighting. Um, it needs to be a relatively dim light, not any brighter than necessary. Minimize blue light emissions. Uh, blue lights, the cooler lights on the color spectrum travel a lot farther and thus pollute more. The warmer lights, orange and red uh, don't travel as far. And so they're much, prefer much preferable for, uh, for outside lighting at night. There's a example of how to reduce light pollution on your house. All these lights that are shining out and up versus a light with a shield just shining down at the front door where you might need it. And there's a photo example of a before and after of how much darker it can get if you just change the fixtures. So the largest concentration of outside lighting in the park is up at the Farview Lodge. Uh, it's about 40% of all of the outside lighting in the park up there. So we selected that area as the site for the park's first large scale dark sky restoration project. And our nonprofit partner, the Mesa Verde Museum Association, who runs the gift shops in the park, purchased and donated uh, 284 dark sky friendly LED light bulbs and donated them to the park. And then in collaboration with Aramark Mesa Verde, who operates the lodge and our volunteers and parks program, we had two teams of volunteers change out about 150 non-compliant light bulbs on 10 lodge buildings, all the buildings where, uh, where the rooms are where people stay. And uh, I know there's a joke about how many rangers it takes to change out a light bulb here, but I'm going to skip that one. Um, because this was actually really exciting for me to see the difference this made. You see a photo there on the right uh, was taken by a visitor who complained about how bright the lights were there uh, at the lodge. And all that we did here at the lodge was change light bulbs. We didn't change fixtures or anything. Um, it was just a few hours of changing out light bulbs and it created a huge difference. So this is the kind of light bulb that we changed out for, um, 2700K, under 500 lumens, warm colors are better, avoiding blue. And we use LED lights and LED lights are Great, they use a lot less energy. And I think a lot of dark sky proponents were really excited about LED lights at first, but then it turns out that because they use so much less energy and are cheaper, uh, that people tend to light a lot more now that we have LED lights. Uh, so we used LED lights 
uh, with these specifications, uh, trying to reduce our overall consumption. So Dr. Bollinger came back after that project and re-examined our lights and verified that now over 67% of our exterior lighting were now compliant with the IDA's standards. So with the completion of that project, uh, we now qualified as a dark sky park. And we still have about 130 of those dark sky friendly light bulbs left to be used in further changing out light bulbs, dark sky restoration projects around the park. So the next step was then putting together a lighting management plan, detailing exactly how exterior lighting would be used around the park and putting together a plan for how we are going to get 100% of our dark sky or our outside lighting compliant with dark sky standards within the next 10 years. This is a photo of some employee housing at Mesa Verde, uh, showcasing some dark sky friendly exterior lighting, uh, shielded lights, uh, mostly not entirely there, uh, but with that warm temperature, which uh, doesn't travel as far. So this project that we undertook at the lodge, uh, I think is really improved opportunities for public stargazing here at Mesa Verde uh, for all of our visitors who stay at the lodge. Our park website actually used to say, there's not good stargazing around the Farview Lodge because of lighting for visitor safety and the visitors might want to seek out a darker place. Well, we have now uh, shown how that that is a, a false dichotomy between visitor safety and having dark skies to enjoy. So with better bulbs, uh, the light is just used more efficiently. And this gives visitors the added benefit of being able to step out of their rooms at the Farview Lodge and see the Milky Way and hundreds of stars now. So we have now been hosting some dark sky evening programs presented by rangers for park visitors at the lodge. And that's another component of becoming a dark sky park is outreach and education about dark sky issues. Uh, for years now, Mesa Verde has offered dark sky evening programs down at the Moorfield Campground Amphitheater. Uh, we've had public events uh, that include stargazing with rangers and volunteers. Uh, we have our winter fests in January, star parties in October, our Luminaria holiday open houses in December. And um, Becoming a dark sky park, we've tried to step up that interpretation and the lodges have been a great place to talk about that. Um, comparing the visitor experience there before and after with just one afternoon of changing out light bulbs uh, is a really huge difference. Um, this is one program we gave uh, myself and my colleague Jill uh, presented the Farview Lodge and highlighted our restoration project there. And several of the visitors uh, said they had never seen the Milky Way before and they were really absolutely thrilled. So once we were confident that we had all of our stars in a row, we submitted our application last November. And in April of this year, Mesa Verde National Park was certified as the world's 100th international dark sky park. Um, altogether, there's about 177 certified dark sky places around the world in 21 countries on six continents. And this is, uh, it's been very exciting for us. Uh, our certification has been covered by media across the country. Lots of comments on social media. People have been asking uh, where to go see the stars when they come into the park now. When I've been out in town having dinner, talking about dark skies, people at the neighboring tables have, have interrupted and said like, how do we get Mancus to become a dark sky community? Uh, it's really exciting to see more and more people um, just knowing about this issue, excited to see the stars and come to Mason Verde for that. So now that we are a dark sky park, uh, looking ahead, there's a lot left to be done. Um, we're most excited uh, for in September, we're gonna be doing a whole Mesa Verde Astrovaganza to celebrate the dark sky certification, um, to do public outreach in neighboring communities. Uh, we have uh, an astrophotographer from the IDA 
We'll be visiting and doing workshops on star photography. We'll have rangers doing talks. That's going to be about September 10th through 19th. Uh, it'll be a great time to come up to the park to see dark skies and learn more about it, about them. Um, this summer we'll be doing campground evening programs uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights all through the summer. And every Saturday night will be a dark sky themed evening program. I will be doing one on this Saturday. Uh, and then we have to continue to make Mesa Verde more dark sky friendly. So we have our lighting management plan to get all of our outside lighting compliant to the last one third uh, over the next 10 years. We're excited to engage in more outreach with local communities and tribal partners uh, and to develop programs and interpretation at the park about native astronomy. Uh, that's something that we're really excited to incorporate in the, the redesign of the Tape and Mesa Museum. We've just uh, put together a mobile story lab trailer to take into communities and to schools. And we're really excited to uh, build programs all about native astronomy, native science, uh, to collaborate with local schools and with uh, our, our descendant communities on on programming that goes beyond just the cliff drawings and really gets into the science that is practiced here at Mesa Verde. Then some things that you can do if you now care a little bit more about dark skies than you did half an hour ago. Uh, one thing you can do is just walk around your house and assess your lighting. You can change out some light bulbs really easily uh, you'd be amazed how much just changing light bulbs in one spot, even if your neighbors still have bright ones, actually does make it darker uh, around your house. You can spread the word about light pollution, advocate for dark skies in your community. We have several communities in Southwest Colorado and uh, the Western Slope that have become dark sky certified communities. You can visit one of those 177 and counting dark sky places and discover and share new ways of seeing the night. And I have two of those to leave us with. From a poem by Wendell Berry. To go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight, and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. And this painting, Luminaria, Night Magic by Jan Wright. Jan Wright is an artist down in Mancus who painted this piece while an artist in residence here at Mesa Verde. I love this painting because she captures my favorite quality of Mesa Verde at night, the, the timelessness of Mesa Verde and places like it, where it's easy to break down the idea of a line of time where the past and the present and the future all come together. And the night skies are a part of the cultural landscape of this place. Here in the Four Corners, we can really experience a night that has changed very little through time. And those stars that we can look up at here uh, connect us with those generations behind us and ahead of us. We can be amazed and inspired by this expansive universe above our heads and recall a sense of holiness and mystery. Um, remember our place in the grand scheme of creation. And it's that kind of view that It just makes me speechless. It sends a shiver down my spine, that connection. And that's, to me, the most important reason why we do all of this work to protect our dark skies is to keep that connection alive for the future for our children and grandchildren. So thank you for coming with me on this journey into the night. Um, I will be thrilled to answer any questions, but I want to remind everyone that tonight we have 
a full super moon. It's going to be the biggest moon tonight that we're going to see in a long time. So even if there's not a whole lot of stars out tonight, it's definitely a good opportunity to get outside away from our glowing screens and look up and in awe at the night sky tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. That was absolutely wonderful. And we have a lot of people who are really enjoying your presentation. Um, let me start with some questions. So this is a question that I have, but also somebody in the program had. Uh, we have reservations this summer at Fairview Lodge, where or Farview Lodge. Where do we go to see the stars most vividly? And I would add, I know a lot of people have bought telescopes during the pandemic. Are there particular places you'd suggest? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thanks to thanks to that work changing our light bulbs, just around the Farview Lodge is a pretty good spot, actually. Uh, walking um, just down the, the path from the lodge to this big, the big parking lot for the old Farview Visitor Center. There's some picnic tables over there. That's a spot where I really like going to look at the stars. Uh, Mesa Verde, of course, is a lot more closed off than a lot of other national parks. All of our archaeological sites are closed at night um, to protect them. Uh, but there's numerous overlooks along that main road, uh, the Mancus Valley Overlook, Montezuma Overlook. Uh, that provides some really good spots to pull over and, and kind of have your own private experience. The campground in the park is also a really good spot to see the stars. It's kind of, it's nestled in Moorfield Valley. And so it's blocked off from a lot of the sky glow from the neighboring communities. So it has a, a narrower, but very dark view of the sky there. Can people come into the park at night or do you have to already be in? Yeah, yeah so the park is always open. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, you can always drive in and out of the main road on the park. It's just the uh, the access to the archeological sites that's closed at sunset. So like the Mesa Top Loop and the Cliff Palace Loop and Weatherall Mesa, you can't go out there at night, um, but that main road has lots of nice spots along it. The lodge and the campground are good spots. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody wanted to know what, what the issue is with blue lights versus warmer lights. So science, phys physical physics is not, is not my strong suit, but from my understanding, um, the, the wave of, of blue lights and other cooler temperature lights travel a lot farther. And so they create more light pollution and, uh, red lights, uh, travel the least far. And so this is why uh, if you go to an astronomy event, they'll often ask you to uh, put a, some red cellophane over your light or, or turn the red setting on your headlamp. Um, the red light doesn't interfere with our night vision. That, that like two hour transition um, to scotopic vision uh, where you can actually see all the colors of the stars uh, get screwed up the moment you look at your phone with white light on it. Uh, but there's also ways you can change your, you know, your phone to, to show in red light. And so I've actually used that, my apps on my phone for evening programs with visitors. As long as you're uh, changing it to red, it's not going to damage your night vision. I didn't know that. Good to know. <laughs> um, there's a couple questions about maybe the downsides of what you all have done. Um, how are you ensuring that sidewalks and walkways and stairs do have enough lighting, especially for older folks or people with mobility issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of resistance to this conversation because people do associate lights with safety. And I, I really encourage people to go on to the International Dark Sky Association's website, darksky.org. They have a lot of information and examples of lighting. Lighting at night is, is not a bad thing. Uh, it's just the excessive use of light that we're trying to combat. So we still have night lights on our paths, on our stairs around the park. Uh, as long as they're shielded and pointing down um, where you're actually, where you actually need the light, um, they're, they're totally good with the IDA, totally good with us. Uh, they're not really interfering with our night vision and they are keeping us from tripping and falling off a canyon edge at night, which nobody wants. <laughs> uh, let's see. 
is there a correlation between dark skies and weather and maybe the bigger yeah. question, climate okay. and drought? Um, well, I mean, our, our climate here in the Southwest does make for especially good stargazing. It's, it's very dry here and our high elevation uh, makes for less atmospheric disturbance. There's literally less air above our heads uh, than people living down at, at sea level. So um, Flagstaff, Arizona, and a similar, uh, similar climate and elevation to us is the first designated dark sky city in the world. And I was just on vacation in Flagstaff last week, and it was really interesting to see what a whole city does to be dark sky friendly. There's still a lot of lights there. They have highways that have big lights over them, but you notice that they're all shielded and they tend to be warmer temperature lights. And even in the middle of a Flagstaff, which is a city of about 120,000 people, you can still look up and see a lot of stars. You can still see the Milky Way. Um, so I recommend a visit to Flagstaff uh, just as an illustration of how it, you don't need to give up light to be dark sky friendly. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as that. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to have plenty of light to have a city that feels safe and, and secure at night uh, while still being able to see the Milky Way at night. So, be on my end. Taylor, maybe you want to read a couple of these questions? Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, would installing the lighting with the sensor to turn on or off with passage um, be helpful? Yes, that, that is something that the IDA encourages uh, because the light is only on when you need it then. And it's not polluting for the majority of the night when you don't actually need a light out there. And then one of the dark sky requirements was identifying potential risk. What are the potential risks for light contamination in the future? The biggest risk that I see is just that the, the trajectory of the last century, every generation sees much brighter lights. Um, the, I talked about this a little bit about LED lights. Um, they're way more energy efficient, better for the environment, cheaper. Uh, but the downside to that is a lot more lighting has been added. Uh, I read some figure about how parking lots alone in America have gotten 10 times brighter in the last 20 years. And a parking lot at night is a place where we do want to have some lights. We want to, we want to know where we're going. We want to see that there's not someone who's going to rob us up ahead. Uh, but just getting brighter and brighter and brighter uh, doesn't help us. Uh, it, it creates the issues with glare. It makes it harder for us to see, especially um, for older eyes, uh, that glare can really damage your night vision. So it makes it much more dangerous to drive. So we live in a relatively unpopulated part of the country here. So far, we have escaped having uh, a tremendously brighter sky. But I see that as, as the main concern going forward is that we, if we continue to add light as much as we have in the past generations, we're not going to be able to see the Milky Way here in Southwest Colorado in a couple more generations. Okay, I think I fixed my problem here. <laughs> um, somebody uh, asked about the impact of light on bird migrations. Can you say a little more on that? Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about this. I know that the lights do impact bird migrations. Um, I know that like bright lights uh, in, in cities, especially like migrating flocks will actually veer off path and go towards the lights of cities. Um, I know that this happens with bats and moths as well. 
uh, all these animals that um, ha travel at night for safety mm -hmm. um, have their migrations impacted. Uh, I don't know much more than that. It's something that I do want to learn more about. Um, has the park considered adding a dedicated area for supporting telescope stargazing? That is a great idea. Yes, we have talked about it and I, I really want to make that happen. So stay tuned. All right. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, about like people looking for advice about telescopes or especially about photographing the stars. I'm, I'm guessing that's not your forte, but uh, do you have any resources to suggest? Um, yeah, not not my wheelhouse specifically. I was uh, I was telling Michelle before we got started that the park has a really nice uh, Solstrom telescope. It's like five thousand dollars. I checked it out and started playing around with it and couldn't figure out how to use it at all. So uh, <laughs> um, I'm not the person to ask about that specifically. Uh, I've I've really learned a lot about just naked eye stargazing. I found that just using binoculars lets you see a lot. And so that has been my entry into astronomy so far is um, I've actually been really impressed with how much you can see with binoculars. That said, telescopes are great. If you find someone that knows how to use them, telescopes are great. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe, maybe with darker skies, maybe we could actually use our naked eyes more instead yeah. of relying on the telescope. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, the question was whether you had any resources you'd like to suggest for photography. Oh, sure. Um, programs, maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any resources about telescopes specifically. Once again, I would direct people to the IDA website, it's darksky.org. They're a fantastic resource. And I've been uh, working with a employee of IDA who's a fantastic astrophotographer. Her name is Betty Maya Foote. And she'll be coming out to the park uh, definitely in September for our Astrovaganza. And she's gonna do a workshop for people on dark sky photography. And one thing I really like about Betty Maya's work uh, is that she, um, she teaches people how to take dark sky photos with the camera they have, not just like, you need this $10,000 camera to take good dark sky photos. Um, it's something that I've been trying to get into uh, taking dark sky photos, and um, there's there's a PDF about astrophotography on IDA's website that I found really helpful. You know, it's um, just getting your settings correct and keeping the camera still for long enough. Uh, I those photos of the light domes were my first foray into dark sky photography, and I've been having some fun taking more more creative photos. Uh, but I'm excited to meet Betty Maya in, per in person uh, to learn more from her. Yeah, I want to be part of that too. <laughs> yeah, we'll, stay, we'll, uh, we'll definitely have that on our park website and park social media. So stay tuned and we'll have more information about um, those kinds of special events coming up. Great. A related question. Do you have any programs where Native Americans talk about their stories about the stars? Yeah, this is definitely something on our on our list to organize. I'm hoping that we can um, have a speaker from one of our tribal communities um, in September. And it's something that we are, are working on as a park. We really want to make sure that we're kind of centering those relationships and making sure that it's a partnership. We're not sharing stories or information, which is not appropriate to share. Uh, so we're reaching out and having those conversations. It's all a little preliminary right now, but, um, but look, looking forward to the future, that's really important to us. Sounds great. Well, uh, questions are sort of petering out and we're at about five o'clock. So I wanna thank you so much for this great talk and you've gotten a lot of love in the comments. Uh, maybe maybe uh, Taylor can send those comments to you. Um, and thank you so much for the great talk and congratulations uh, on the dark sky um, recognition and for the great work you're doing. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat. And um, I believe that my contact info is available. If people want to reach out with more questions, uh, please feel free to email me. Um, we're 
we're really excited to engage with the community more broadly with, with dark skies and and um yeah come up come up to the park at night sometime all right thank you spencer yeah thanks have a good yeah. night everybody